This is Mrinal Otari, MBA India's Program Coordinator, here to introduce you to our very first speaker. She is a spaceship designer and an exceptional entrepreneur. She is probably the only person in the world to have visited the Arctic and the Antarctic on invitation. She is the sole space entrepreneur in the world to have co-founded various space companies on three different continents, Earth to Orbit in Bangalore, Moonfront in San Francisco, Liquifer Systems Group in Vienna. She has also worked for the International Space Station program at Boeing in California and did a short stint at NASA's Johnson Space Center. In 2021, she launched India's first dedicated space think tank, Spaceport Sarabhai. And she is here to discuss the blur between moon exploration and exploitation. Please welcome Dr. Mohanty. Thank you for joining us today, ma'am. The floor is yours. Thank you, Renal. Thank you very much for introducing me. And a uh, very warm thank you to the entire team, the Moon Village Association team in India for inviting me. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, uh, probably good morning in some parts of the world. Um, so what I will be talking to you today will be um, an overarching trajectory um, of the moon as it has manifested through my professional career and also in a contemporary sense, where do we as a global community stand in terms of the next steps for lunar exploration? So I'll be sharing my screen now. Just give me a moment. So is everybody able to see my screen? Gracio, can you confirm, please? Yes, sir. we are able to see your screen, ma'am. OK, wonderful. So my professional journey began in uh, 1997 with a brief stint at NASA Johnson, where I got to work on space shuttle and Mir missions. So there was a cooperation underway between the United States and Russia, where they would send an American astronaut from, for long duration stints, stints on the Mir space station. And the word international cooperation is a very tricky one. Um, I remember when I started off um, my stint in uh, at Johnson, having a conversation with my dad, who is one of the space pioneers of India, um, and he told me that international cooperation is often not what it seems. Here is a beautiful picture of the, the, the home planet, um, the pale blue dot, taken from one of the Chinese orbiters, Chang'e 5, in 2014. When we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Apollo landing, I got a call from London from one of the big TV channels and they were planning a mini series on the Apollo missions. Uh, and this mini series was supposed to have three episodes. So I asked them very bluntly, so are you going to feature the fact that China has been the only nation in recent years to have landed a spacecraft on the moon successfully and has now done it three times? So the answer I got back was, well, maybe we'll talk about China for a little bit in the third episode of our mini series. So the reason I'm sharing this anecdote with you is there, there's always been a bias in the way space missions are portrayed in the international media. And there has, for the longest time, we have been looking at space missions with a Hollywood lens and a lens where pretty much all the cool stuff is done by NASA. So I think in this century, we have to create a new narrative for space exploration where the Eastern Hemisphere, whether it's Japan or China or India, are no more in the blind spot. And I think this picture to me summarizes that shift in the narrative. The next picture that I'm gonna share with you here. So Gracia, I'm having a problem going yeah, to my next slide. Yes, yeah. yeah, sir, you can check now, ma'am. Okay. Nope, it's not working. Ah, there it is, it works. So the next image composite that I've selected here is circa 1972. That's me in my Earth rover, and that's Eugene Cernan on the last Apollo landing, which happened in December of 1972. So this should give you a bit of an idea of where I began sort of my space journey. And growing up 
I remember my dad uh, showing me slides of these grainy Apollo landing videos um, and also photographs that, that were shot by him as a screen grab when he was in Canada and the first moon landing had happened. So I really grew up with space all around me. It was, it was part of my formative years and it's always stayed with me. Uh, I think you'll have to help me move the slides, Gracia, because they're getting stuck. Can you check now, ma'am? Nope, it's still getting stuck. Just let me see. So while we while we fix this technical problem, I think what's interesting about the moon is that it has no atmosphere. So the natural illumination and the entire gamut of colors of the electromagnetic spectrum that it brings to us, the scattering of rays, is something that you will miss on the moon if you were ever to take a trip to the moon. A lot of it there is sort of black and white and gray. Um, so, Gracia, I'm waiting for you to solve the problem. Yeah, yes, I guess you can move it now, ma'am. Can you check once? Not yet. <laughs> no. Okay, yeah, let me just try. Give me a second. I think I would recommend you, uh, yes, you share the slide from your end and just move yes, the yes. slides forward. Yeah, sure. So for those of you who are listening in, take a close look at the photograph uh, of Eugene Cern and, and, the, and the moon buggy. And the lunar soil, unlike, say, sand on planet Earth, if you take a close look at the particles of lunar regolith, they're very, very fine and very, very sharp like glass. You know, because there are no weathering forces. There are no winds. There are no, there's no running water. So unlike a grain of sand, which is rounded, lunar dust is, is, is kind of jaggedy. It's sharp like glass. And the nature of lunar dust is such that it gets into everything. It gets into the creases of your spacesuit if you go out on a lunar sortie. It gets into the mechanical parts of your wheels. And if you bring it into your habitat and breathe it in, it'll go and sit in your lungs. So one of the most treacherous things that we space architects have to deal with when we conceive uh, ideas for future habitation on the moon or future transportation of the moon, we have to take into account lunar dust. Um, so I think the other thing to remember uh, about the moon and designing for living on the moon or exploring the moon, the surface exploration, is the fact that we have to deal with radiation. We often forget that on Earth, in addition to the atmospheric blanket that protects us, we also have two Van Allen radiation belts. And once you're on the moon, you don't have any of these protective layers. So that's the second thing that we designers, uh, engineers, architects, need to plan for. And that's what makes designing for lunar exploration so very exciting. Um, I'm just waiting for one of you guys, Ronald or Crescio, to take over the presentation. So I'll yes. stop sharing. Yes, so you can stop share. I can, I'll do it. Wonderful. Let's go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Yes. So here is a rendering of a future moon base, which is an architectural concept created by one of the teams that participated in a workshop that I and a couple of my colleagues, we co-hosted and coached in the Netherlands at ESTEC, which is one of the European Space Agency centers. Uh, so in this particular concept, you can see that it is a hybrid concept. So there are inflatable, rigidizable parts, and there are solid parts. And this particular base would have to be built through what we call piecemeal architecture, which means you carry different parts to the, base, to the, to the lunar surface and you assemble them robotically on the surface of the moon. I'm just sharing a couple of advanced concepts. And these are from the times when I was in San Francisco and was running a small company that I started, which was called Moonfront. Next slide, please. The other concept that many of us who are working um, you know, on advanced concepts for the near future would be a subterranean lunar base. And here you are seeing a cutaway section elevation of a subterranean base. One of the good things about having a subterranean base is that the lunar regolith becomes like a bunker that envelops you and protects you from radiation naturally. Um, I wouldn't go into the details of each of these lunar base designs because I think we only have 30 minutes, uh, but I just wanted to give you um, 
visuals that would fire up your imagination as to what are the kind of things that we will see in the decades ahead. Next slide, please. This is a real photograph taken underwater at a tank in Marseille at a company called Comex. So the Vienna company that I co-founded often works in a consortium format on very many projects, which in, involves not only designing um, habitation, transportation, exploration systems, but also building prototypes and testing those prototypes in simulated conditions. So what you're looking at here is a photograph taken from the project Moonwalk, where the consortium developed protocols for human robotic collaboration and communication. And you, you can see a couple of simonauts underwater testing a rover and also testing some instruments that would be used for collecting lunar samples. So the reason I wanted to share this photograph is to give you a sense of how simulations on Earth are extremely important in testing hardware that will be used in the future on other planetary destinations. Let's go to the next slide. This is a rendering again. It was called Lava Hive. And this particular 3D printed base concept was designed uh, by my Vienna company, Liquifer, in partnership with the European Astronaut Center in Cologne. And it won one of the NASA prizes. What I want you to see in this, uh, in this particular rendering of a future base is that some parts here are built using 3D printing where in situ resources are used. So the soil on Mars will be used for construction. And some of the other parts have been scavenged from the descent module that is supposed to have landed. And this then becomes a, yet again, a hybrid concept, a hybrid base. Uh, so 3D printing is going to radically transform how we build in the future on planetary surfaces, but we are some years away. We are currently still in a lab phase where we are experimenting with simulated lunar regolith and Martian regolith and you know, techniques of uh, lava casting and sintering to see how we can build on a larger scale. So I think we'll have to eventually and slowly get out of the research phase and get into a technology readiness level, which then allows us to build at least small parts to start with and then larger, uh, you know, so larger hardware and larger habitat structures and so on. Let's go to the next slide, please. So this is an image I have excerpted from an article that I read two days ago. And this particular article was talking about how whaling, even back, uh, you know, in, in a couple of centuries ago, was a big, uh, it, it was it was a it was a large scale enterprise where whales were hunted to provide whale blubber and whale oil. You know they could be used as lubricants for machinery during the industrial revolution, as fuel for lighting, and even the baleen, which is essentially the soft teeth that the whales have, uh, was used in items such as corsets and umbrellas. So the reason I wanted you to see this illustration is to remind ourselves that often the line separating exploration and exploitation is quite blurred. If you look at the Royal Geographical Society of the United Kingdom, um, they would send out expeditions, um, you know, back in the 1800s, 1700s, and, and often these expeditions would have other mission objectives as well. And those mission objectives clearly were not um, neither environment friendly, uh, we can go to the next slide, nor were they friendly for the species that inhabited those geographies other than the humans that were visiting. I've taken this image from an Antarctic expedition that I was a part of. Um, the expedition took place in March of 2017, and that's autumn in Antarctica. It was the first ever cultural expedition to the planet because most expeditions to Antarctica are scientific, but this was different. We had 40 artists invited from around the world to be on this expedition and eight interdisciplinary experts, and I was one of the interdisciplinary experts. The, the beauty of being in this 
in this image for real, being part of this expedition was, it really for the first time felt otherworldly. It felt like I was on another planet. And it was very disorienting in some ways. On one hand, you see sublime beauty. On the other hand, you see the savagery of the landscape. Uh, and it does things to your mind. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie, uh, the Russian film Solaris, but I think that's a fantastic science fiction film, which brings in the psychological dimension in exploration. Uh, while we were in Antarctica, on, let's go to the next slide. Uh, every day we would have two landings. What, what that would mean is the expedition vessel would take us close to a landmass, and then we would get into these inflatable dinghies called uh, zodiacs and carry some of the artist installations to the landing and set it up. This particular image shows you uh, one of the Japanese artists on the left hand side and the art commissioner, uh, the Russian artist, Alexander Punomarev. So the Japanese artist is uh, Yasuaki. They are together, they are um, sort of creating a rope using uh, tech, you know, cords from two different spools. One is indigo dyed, the Japanese way, and the other one is plain white. And I want you to look carefully at the background and you can see these large bones and these are the bones of humpback whales. And that should be a very clear indication of what has in the past happened on these landings. So the expeditioners, uh, unlike us who had come to interact with this icy continent in an artistic manner, had done things which shouldn't have been done. Next slide, please. So what you saw in the previous slide, Yasuaki's cord that was knitted together as a community, you know, with, by the people on board, was then used to fly this beautiful, colorful kite on another place, another landing, which was called Deception Island, a volcanic island in Antarctica. You can see the color palette is completely changed. Um, and as the kite rose, the cord sort of unraveled into eight strands. And what the artist was trying to depict is that we come from these different meridians around the earth and come together as a single chord and then, you know, we soar. So I think it was a beautiful uh, art piece, symbolically speaking. But what I also want you to see in the background, uh, or rather, I mean, the foreground, I think I would call it the background here, is the silos. Can you see those rusted silos, those large drums? Those are the ones where Previously, expeditioners had wiped out the seal population in the area. You know, so in Antarctica, we saw crab seals and uh, elephant seals and leopard seals and whatnot. So they had wiped out the seal population in that area and were using these silos for storing seal blubber. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, I chose to share this particular plaque that was left by the Apollo 11 astronauts. And it clearly reads that one, I think men is a bit odd to read it in, in, in today's, um, uh, in contemporary times, but essentially we're saying that here we are from planet earth, um, we've come to the moon and we come in peace and for all mankind. I think that was a tall order because for those of you who are interested in history, uh, world history and also in geopolitics might recall that this landing happened in July of 1969, the day that sort of we are celebrating at the International Moon Day. And few months earlier in 1969 in March, R Richard Nixon, who signed off on this plaque, he had ordered a covert operation in Cambodia, in Eastern Cambodia, where they were uh, bombarding the hell out of Cambodia. And that was part of the Vietnam War and the Cambodian War, civil wars. So what I'm trying to say here is we humans are quite hypocritical and walk away with pride with the kind of hypocrisy that we have, that here we are bombing a small country on earth and destroying lives. And there we are saying we come in peace. So I think I think the juxtaposition historically of the events that were taking place at the time is a wake up call, even in today's atmosphere of 
unrest, of conflict, of war. Uh, and I think we as humans need to recognize that. We cannot gloss over it and just talk about our accomplishments without thinking about the anthropogenic effects of exploration uh, and also how we conduct ourselves on our home planet and on planets that we will visit in the future. Let's go to the next one, please. So for this particular slide, I was debating whether I should choose the photograph of Eugene Cernan uh, on the last landing where he has just come back from a lunar sortie into the habitat. And he looks like a coal miner because the lunar dust is so fine and it's kind of uh, sticks to your suit and everything you have on that he actually looks like he's been in the coal mines and just come back. The reason I, I wanted to choose that is, is, is that's a picture which is not one of your classic PR images uh, that a space agency wants to see, but the reality of lunar exploration, how difficult, how challenging and how treacherous it's going to be. And then I kind of chose this particular picture, which is a poster from a moon film in 2009, directed by Duncan Jones. I don't know, maybe some of you have seen this film. It's about a guy called Sam Bell, who is experiencing a personal crisis as he gets near the end of a solitary stint mining expedition on the far side of the moon. The reason I wanted to use this image or this slide was to remind us all that it won't be only scientists uh, who will be visiting the moon from time to time, maybe for short durations, maybe for long durations, but really what is, honestly speaking, the, the reality, the, the push, the, the momentum for all of these lunar activities? Is it going to be peaceful or is it going to be about mining? Uh, is it going to be about setting up you know, telescopes? I think it's going to be a mix of everything and how we balance it out is going to be critical. Let's go to the next slide, please. So this is a screenshot of a policy piece that I wrote for Friends of Europe, which is a think tank based in Brussels. And as you can see from the date, the policy piece was written in December of 2020, a couple of months after the Artemis Accords were signed by the United States and its allies. There were eight signatories at that point. This was around the tr time Trump was to leave office. Uh, so I remember it was kind of accelerated and this, the, the accords were signed. And that's the time when I, I, I wrote this particular opinion piece. I think what I want us, and now we have nine signatories because France signed the accords last month, I believe. So three out of the nine signatories of this new agreement are overtly keen on off earth mining and have taken legal steps to ensure that their companies can own and sell the celestial loot. Therefore, I think it would be unwise to view this agreement as a benign instrument to facilitate cooperation between friendly nations for quote unquote sustainable exploration of outer space. So if those of you again who are in the policy space or like to follow what's going on in terms of legislations, in terms of policy making, in 2015 during the Obama administration, the US Congress unilaterally signed an uh, passed a legislation which allows American companies to own whatever they bring back from other celestial bodies. Two years later, Luxembourg Parliament passed a similar asteroid mining law. And now the UAE, which is a relatively new space uh, faring country, is also looking at legal instruments for, you know, for, for similar purposes. I think the honesty of intent that I read in an interview of the then director general when I wrote this piece of the UA Space Agency was quite, um, I would say, uh, I mean, it was quite heartwarming to see because he was not trying to be hypocritical about why we are going there, out there to explore. He was comparing outer space to the laws of the sea and the international waters where no state can claim sovereignty over the sea, but commercial fishing operations can happen and the fishermen can sell what they catch and so on. So I think he was quoted as saying, if you don't own the fish, then why go to the sea? I think I like the honesty of that expression. 
And we don't have to keep using the word sustainable for everything we do when the outcomes could be quite the contrary. I think we have to face this question of sustainability head on now rather than later. Next slide. That's my last slide, guys. And yet again, I have chosen a slide from the Antarctic expedition. It's a beautiful projection by uh, an artist from Sao Paulo in Brazil, where we projected certain artworks and words that he had composed for this particular art installation. And you can see it's been projected onto a windswept iceberg, which even has a hole somewhere to the left-hand side. And I think the reason I chose this particular projection, there were several others from this uh, art experiment, was, is it utopia? Is it hopeless? Is there still hope? And I personally think there is still hope. But I think we as humans, as a collective who are keen to explore other parts of our solar system and beyond need to sit back and contemplate sometimes and not play games internationally either indiv as individual nations or collectively where we go out and do the kind of things we did on earth on other planetary destinations and with that i think i'll wrap up and Renal, over to you and i'm happy to take questions Thank you, ma'am, for an enlightening presentation on the right way of exploration. So do we have any good questions that I could respond to? Yes, so we have a question from Mr. Jatan. So yes. he, yeah, so. I can, yeah, yeah, I can respond to that. So, um, Jatin, that's a, that's a very good question. In fact, that's a question that I've been, um, not just individually, but also with some of, uh, some of our members from the think tank we have been discussing. Um, and we are planning to not, not only come out with a sort of a position paper on, on this particular question, whether or not India should sign the Artemis Accords, um, and if it should, then what are the kind of provisos and other things that we should make sure be included in the Artemis Accords? So I won't answer this question simply because I think it is a very delicate question. And um, in principle, I personally uh, and professionally, I support all kinds of international cooperation. But I think we have to look at the pragmatic side of what this agreement means and how it relates to the international treaties that currently exist. So I think in principle, yes, I think we should partner with uh, not just the American side. I think we should also partner with uh, if the Russians and the Chinese are building a lunar station, I think we should partner with them too. Um, I personally don't see, um, I mean, of course, geopolitics comes into everything that we do. Um, but having been in this profession for more than 25 years, I think cooperation is a way forward. So again, I will not answer your question directly yet because we are looking into the finer details and we are reading between the lines. And we are also thinking of having a round table uh, to discuss exactly this particular issue, Japan. The other question I have here is, um, what kind of 3D printers are being used for lunar regolith soil? So I would encourage you, Anandita, to go online and Google for the material sciences department of the European Astronaut Center in Cologne. My company in Vienna has been working, in, working with them uh, to test small samples that are being fabricated in the lab using simulants. I I like okay, and then I believe there's one other question. Um, that's also a 3D printing question. And okay, well, Georgiana Moruz, um, I think I will I will let your comment be. Ruhi, well, I'm happy you participated, Ruhi. And I think with that, I'll hand it over to Nunal because I know you must be running out of time. And Jatin, you are next. So all the best for your talk. Uh, and happy moon day, but 
honestly, me and Jatin, we had a little uh, exchange on the side. For us, every day is a moon day, guys. Um, so it's a moon day every day. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, yeah. thank you, Dr. Ramonti, for having a very interesting presentation and also answering some of our questions. So we much, very, really appreciate your time for that. Thank you. Thank you yeah, very thank much, you. guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ma'am.